So this is the burial mound. What I do notice is that while it's quite large, it's conical. Large in this context. We'll walk around another 90 degrees roughly and see if it maintains that configuration. And no, it does not appear to be a conical mound. Trapezoidal perhaps, or oblong perhaps. Guessing that this peninsula design formed in the upper right hand corner uh, is reflecting what is this peninsula like topography on the top of this little plateau. Here our view is from D which is slightly to our right ahead of us and then the distance is the large mound we were on. We're now proceeding here to the left walking down along to the left past the maternal clusters if you will. All of this ridge line prescribed by the hiking trail uh, was devoid of trees and filled with a spotted arrangement of these small uh, huts. From this perspective you can see that this drops off, this top ridge line drops off pretty strongly down in these little gullies suggesting that all the habitation was generally towards the top where we're walking. Now we're behind D. Footnote from the interpretive sign on surviving the winter as I pan about. During the cold winter months, families live mostly on corn, plus some dried fish and fresh meat. Women raise the corn along with squash and sunflowers in gardens near their home and on the bottomlands along the river. Men hunted deer, raccoons, turkeys in the fall and winter and devoted the warmer months to catching fish and sh gardening, gathering shellfish. Women used the animals' hides to make clothes for their families. I wonder if they had a way of preserving the shellfish. Interestingly, the trail takes us away from that plateau across the ravine, if you will, But it gives us an idea of how quickly this land drops off. And yet, there are still areas over here that are relatively flat that would accommodate a continuation of this community's footprint, if you will. Now in a moment I'll show you the remains of a maternal cluster. This was a society based on a lineage through mothers, not through fathers. So a young man starting a new family would build his home next to his wife's mother's cluster. So here we can see a pretty good size mound right here. And in the background another large one. And probably they were built on mounds just the same way that you might in the old days have placed your tent on a little mound so that when it rained the water would drain quickly away from the tent. Okay, through the trees you should be able to see on the left hand side the back of that interpretive sign. To the right you'll see a fairly large tree and between the two and toward between us and the sign is that first mound and then we're standing next to another even larger mound that's a little bit higher so you can imagine that perhaps the oldest of the female line had her home for certain on this particular mound. I, s I stand back about 20 feet just try to imagine in your mind life going on here. Try to think of the sounds Here another what looks to be a substantial mound in which that stump is within the mound as it circles around from the right to the left. And even through the trees there we can make out what looks like another mound including that first bit of green, fresh green that we see. But again, am I really seeing mounds? I don't know. Isn't that a pretty stump? 
with that bright light green moss or algae mixed in with the darker green and then whatever we call those other growths not only orangey color but looks like there's some white there The question in this interpretive sign is, where did they go? About 600 years ago they left. There's no evidence that they were forced out. Um, some of the homes were burned, but their goods were removed before they were burned. So that's usually a ritualistic evidence. It's thought that they might have just splintered and went to various tribes that still remained in the area until about 500 years ago. And then it's real hazy, because by 500 years ago, the ancestors of the Chickasaw, the Choctaw, the Creek, and the Cherokee had settled in the region. Some descendants of the people who lived here may have joined the Chickasaw. Notice how that implies that they are two distinct groups and two distinct ethnicities. As I look about in front of me and in front of that log that you see lying down, looks to be another mound that I think I see. Okay, once again we are about to cross the palisade that surrounded <clears throat> where we have walked. So this is that palisade line. Here's where we crossed the first time, here we're crossing the second time. It does continue to beg the question, how far did that palisade go? At the very least you would think it would have formed a loop from one side of the cliff on the Tennessee River all the way around to the cliff on the Tennessee River again. It's interesting when we look at a remnant of a society like this that there's so little that we can gain and have left. And then we look at our huge steel and concrete built and glass buildings and say, well, that can never happen to our civilization. Uh, what we've created is too massive, too indestructible. But there's a documentary, I believe it's called Aftermath, and it depicts what would happen if all of a sudden humans were not here, period. They just stop being here. And then it goes through starting from the short term all the way up to the many years that it would take before everything, including our huge buildings, would collapse into nothingness. Of the 25,000 plus who died in the two or three days of battle here at Shiloh, many lie here. Most of their graves simple some so simple that they are these square blocks or oblongs. Don't know what that means. But some, for some reason, have been immortalized with, relatively speaking, grandiose graves. And I just wonder why. don't know specifically why that flags at half-mast, but my guess is that all national cemeteries fly always at half-mast. I have wandered through many cemeteries like this, both for our country and others, and always wondered a bit at whether I could justify walking on graves until I read this plaque. It was driven home a bit more when there were three people laughing and joking about something loud enough to be heard across the cemetery. And I looked at them 
and I wondered. It's interesting that each stone is numbered. At first I couldn't fathom what it was because it's in the 1800s, which is the same year as the war, but actually they're just numbered sequentially. The only thing a gentleman and I could deduce or guess is that the short stubby ones are unknowns. There are also regular sized stones that are marked unknown. Walk places like this, the only thing that makes any sense is, Getty, is Lincoln's Gettysburg Address.